Um, so the piece is uh, a piece where you uh, follow a map around the Botanic Garden and you stop in eight different stations around the garden and you listen to the play on headphones as you're walking. It began where I wanted to make a, a piece that used this very kind of quiet, intimate voice of kind of whispering somebody in somebody's ear, um, which you could do live, you know, you would be able to do that with real audiences, but for most people that would be a slightly uncomfortable experience to have a, a stranger come, you know, very, very close <laughs> and whisper in the room. Um, which could be interesting, you know, for a piece in itself, but for this piece I didn't, I didn't want that kind of discomfort, I wanted it to be something that, that felt very soothing and, you know, and that you felt drawn into this sort of level of intimacy. Um, and so that was one of the starting points. And so therefore the technology that we use, uh, you know, is, is, you know, is very good for that. But at the same time, I, I wanted to make a piece that could, could happen in a garden. And particularly the garden that we first did it in, uh, the Botanical Gardens in Glasgow, is one that has quite a sort of, um, sort of mythic status almost uh, for people who grew up in that part of Glasgow. I presented it as part of the Bard in the Botanics uh, Shakespeare season in that park. And so therefore, if I was going to, it was the first time they'd ever presented a new piece of work. And so they would have needed to, um, you know, had to have some kind of link to Shakespeare. And so I wanted to take themes from A Midsummer Night's Dream, which was the first piece of theatre I ever saw when I was eight years old. Um, and apparently I was completely mesmerised, but I have no memory of it at all. But I was a very fidgety child. I'm still quite a fidgety adult now. But um, I was very fidgety and apparently I was completely wrapped and loved it. Um, and also, of course, you know, in the Botanic Gardens, Midsummer Night's Dream is set in a forest, and so, you know, there's an obvious uh, kind of uh, link between that. And so that was where I started. This is going to be fun, back and forth. Um, so it was commissioned by the garden in this festival that takes place in the garden in Glasgow. How did you act? I'm, this is a question that I'm personally, and I hope others are well curious in knowing the answer to. From an artistic process point of view, how did you approach creating this piece? I can't wrap my head around whether this is a story, a text that you knew you wanted to write and that you created completely and then started the process of thinking about placing it in a garden situation, or were you aware of the garden and how that would inform your writing? They all, they all came at the same time, really. Yeah. Um, no, it was conceived for a piece for, as a piece for the garden. So you were aware of this, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um, and uh, and I wrote it uh, when I did my PhD. They sent me on a um, on an exchange to the Czech Republic to Brno in the Czech Republic, which is the second city of the Czech Republic. Um, uh, and so, as a sort of reward to myself for writing, I had a target. I had to write a thousand words of the thesis every day. And as a reward, I would do what I call uh, scrapbook writing, which is to to begin writing the text, but, but I write in a random order and I write whichever bit feels like the right bit to write at that time. I don't begin at the beginning and, and write to the end. Um, and then I come back and rework it and edit it as I'm going. And so I wrote it there, but in the knowledge that it would you know, be placed in that garden. And I think I wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't a garden that I knew well already. Um, I think I needed that kind of knowledge in my head. And it's something that I've done quite often as I've written is write something for a location that I know well, but, but writing somewhere else. The piece that, I, uh, that we've just finished doing at the Edinburgh Fringe, a piece called Sub Rosa, was originally written where the audience were taken on a backstage tour of a 140-year-old theater. But I wrote it in Delhi, in India, um, which was a very strange experience to sit in Delhi thinking about Victorian Glasgow. Um, and so it's something that I've kind of done a, yeah, I've done quite a lot of Thank you for uh, referencing Sub Rosa because my next, you, you've led perfectly into my next question. Um, and that is this whole idea and the language we use to talk about work which is site specific. I've been with David for the um, last couple of days um, and we've had a sort of joyous and wonderful exchange of ideas. And one of the things that he said early on was that he had a somewhat of an aversion to this notion of site specific and uh, you'll notice when I talked about the work I used the word site sensitive I don't like that either. oh you don't like that one either <laughs> great so I'd like I mean I'd like for you to talk a little bit about um, for lack of a better term site specific work sure. because in reality it's something that you're almost devoted to on some level as an artist 
Okay, good. Well, <laughs> respond to that. So respond to that, and then I'm going to dig a little bit farther. Okay. Um, in, in terms of it being something that, that I have done a lot of, it's, it's, it's not something that I... I was quite surprised the first time a journalist said to me that you're a site-specific writer maker. And I thought, oh, am I? I don't know. Mm. Okay. You know. um, it's not something that I... It's not something even that I have a particular passion about, actually. I think the work always... You know, I come from a performance art background um, and have moved the time more towards... Uh, uh, sort of towards what we think of as traditional theatre, theatre that has a narrative and has characters and drama and conflict and all of those things, and is a bit more emotionally engaging and a bit more emotionally satisfying, because a lot of that performance art can be very cerebral and very dry. And so there'll always, I think, be some level of sort of formal innovation to the work. There'll always be uh, a way in which I'm kind of stretching what theatre is. And so, so I tend to avoid... No, I don't mind when people say site-specific. I'm not uptight about it. But, mm -hmm. um, I, I generally would say site-based or site-responsive. or but site site responsive Site-sensitive, okay. I just think it's linguistic soup. I don't think that means anything. Site-sensitive, <laughs> it's like, what? What is that? Site-responsive. Site-responsive or site-based or site on sea. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've, you've referenced Sub Rosa, which um, David has just finished uh, a run of at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And this is the piece that takes place in the backstage of uh, Victorian theatre. Would you talk about um, your other major site, Responsive Work, that um, we were talking about the other night? I think it's very Home interesting. Hindrance. Home Hindrance? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we made a, a piece that was written to be performed in my home. Um, uh, where the audience moved from room to room and there's a different actor in each room. Um, and so it could only ever be performed for six people at a time because it was limited by... Uh, one of the rooms that we took people into was the bathroom and the actor in the bathroom removed her makeup and got undressed and got in the shower and had a shower and then sat and, you know, dried herself and sat on the towel at the edge of the... Um, on the edge of the bath and people were... Well, actually, one night somebody uh, fainted. <laughs> <laughs> He was leaning against the wall, and he just kind of stayed leaning against the wall and just went, <laughs> but without falling backwards. Um, and 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 for me, what was important about that piece was that I'm uh, very often when you write, people assume that that what you've written is, is very closely related to your own life, and that and they take this sort of psychobiographical approach to your work, and they think that it must have, you know, and particularly, you know, what what's uncomfortable with Sussurus, you know, for, the, for the people who've seen it, is that this kind of imagining that that must be my life story, and, you know, and they're kind of, they're like, well, you know, what's your relationship like with your father? And I'm like, oh, my dad's really nice, and, you know, so my, both my parents are really nice, and they're like, really? Really? Um, which, so that can become very frustrating, and actually with Sub Rosa it was even more extreme. I was telling you a story yeah. about this woman that I met, and she was, was at a Christmas party, and she was drunk, and she was, she went, in the, suddenly in the middle of the conversation, she went, oh my God! Are you David Leddy? And I was like, um, yes, what, what? And she, um, and she was saying to her friend, oh my God, oh my God, have you seen, oh my God, he's showing, you have to tell me what, what happened to you as a child? And I said, well, n nothing, I have a very, very nice childhood, really. Um, and she said, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and her friend uh, kind of tried to diffuse the situation. He said, well, you know, I used to work with Janice Galloway, who wrote that famous book, The Trick is to Keep Breathing, which is about depression. And she would get very frustrated that she would get invited, you know, onto, uh, you know, to, uh, panel shows to talk about depression. And she said, so I've, I've never had depression. I just wrote a book about someone who's depressed. I made it up. And, you know, and that made her really angry that, that people didn't think she could do that as an artist, that, you know, that that had to just be her life story. Um, and the woman went, no, no, you haven't seen this play. No, that has to come from somewhere. <laughs> and, and I said to her, really, please, please believe me, I'm not a Victorian chorus girl who burnt to death under the stake. Well, come on. Yeah. And she's like, no, no, it comes from somewhere. Um, and afterwards, I, I went and talked to a writer friend who was somewhere else at the party, and he said, well, you should have given Agatha Christie's answer. Apparently, whenever she, people asked her, where do you get your ideas, she would say, Harrods, darling. <laughs> so that's my that's my answer now. But so but what I was really interested in when we made Home Hindrance, the show that was made in my flat, was that um, was playing with that idea about work which is based on a writer's own life. And I wanted to, for the first time, write something that was very carefully rooted in 
events that had happened to me or events that had happened to, to the people around me. Um, and to write about the ethics of that and about you know, whether or not that's a good thing to do. Um, and one of the characters in the piece is a doctor who talks about the fact that in, within medical ethics, if uh, I as a doctor make uh, an, a study of you and I, and I write an article about you, I have to show you the article. And you're not allowed to change the original article, but you're allowed to add a comment at the end. And that in a piece of theatre or in a piece of art where a writer writes about the people around them, there's no opportunity for that to happen. If you and I have an argument, turn it into a scene in a piece of theatre, you're not there to, you know, to give your side of it, and particularly if you're dead. Um, and so that's really, you know, I mean, it kind of speaks for itself. But, um, and so that really was the starting point for Home Hindrance, was this idea that of kind of the ethics of writers writing about the lives of the people around them. And I, I have a partner who's very sick with uh, kidney failure. And immediately before making the piece, he was very, very ill with sclerosing peritonitis, and he nearly died. And that was kind of the starting point, was thinking of, you know, obviously I spent a lot of time thinking about what would happen if he died and what my life would be like. And that is the sort of emotional root of that piece. And so uh, on a sort of practical level, none of the characters are me or my partner or anyone like that. Um, but emotionally, it's very, it's very much rooted in, in my experience of that. And then... And so for me, that's why it was very important that it be performed in our home and that the structure of the evening is like coming to our house for dinner and you don't buy tickets, you're, you know, you're just asked maybe to, you know, to bring some wine or some nibbles or something the way you would if you were coming to a dinner party and that we, you know, we host you when, when we arrive and then the show begins and then we arrive again at the end of the show. Um, and so that was, and that was, actually I was very proud of it. It was very beautiful and very moving.